Sunday from the lectionary. Uh, we'll, we'll look at why we're just picking the regular lectionary in a moment. This is John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. So I want to take a moment for why we would practice Lectio Divina. Like many practices, it's meant to, to deepen our faith and work on our relationship with our God. But it also is an act of service because it has a lot to do with our relationship with other people. The world is not perfect. And we all make bad decisions. In Lent, we try to look for our part in this. It is not our place to tear down people because of their bad decisions. Going back to today's scripture, not even God does that. The Son did not come here to condemn the world. Someone reminded me of this last night as we talked about Harry Potter. And I haven't read the books in a while. I haven't had the heart to. But I remember the heroes, for all their heroics, making a lot of messes. They often act like they're in charge in front of the other students. They barge into many situations with that Gryffindor bravery uh, without really thinking. They've hurt some people. But you know what? They're young. They are young, and that explains so much. They're just kids, and they mess up. But one of them definitely makes every situation better. There's this character called Hermione, who's always about being patient and thinking things through. She's always looking at things from different perspectives, and that helps. The Christian community could use a lot of Hermione's. Do you have something? Hermione's not really that pretty. That's fair. That's fair. I, I am not a patient person, so Hermione seems patient to me. But yes, uh, every, anytime you see me being patient, that is from God. That is not innate. I was not born with that. Um, but the Christian community could use more thinking things through before barging in. Many Christians love to think that they're right. And when people rush into things, it's a little uglier than some school kids. I had a friend, and it's a hard story, I'll just mention it briefly, um, and a friend with cerebral palsy. And she got physically hurt in the church because some Christian said God was telling her to make my friend walk out of her wheelchair. And if that Christian had paused, or thought that through, or asked if God really wanted her to do that, then no one would have been hurt. Then there's words, just Words, sometimes careless. People cause harm just by rushing in with words. The author of Harry Potter has written a whole lot of words on the internet, and she's convinced she's right, and it's, it's hurt people. People in the moment when they say or do something are so sure that what they're about to do or say is right, and that is so, so dangerous. We live in a world where people make decisions without pause. So how do Christians learn to be better? Practice. Christians have always needed practice. Making good decisions is not automatic for anybody. There are spiritual practices out there for just that. It obviously helps to, to be patient and thoughtful in the moment. Obviously, that helps to do that in the moment. But there are actually some things that we can do in advance 
ahead of time, before we're even in a situation. And our practice for today, Lectio Divina, is something we can do before we head out into our week. The steps are really simple. And the only thing we need to bring to the table is willingness. And I'd like to read a few words on that. My uh, little devotional that I read every morning uh, on March 7th had a page on the key is willingness. And it's just really quick. It says, once we have placed the key of willingness in the lock and have the door ever so slightly open, we find that we can always open it some more. The willingness to give up my pride and self-will to a power greater than myself has proved to be the only ingredient absolutely necessary to solve all of my problems today. Even the smallest amount of willingness, if sincere, is sufficient to allow God to enter and take control over any problem, pain, or obsession. My level of comfort is in direct relation to the degree of willingness I possess at any given moment to give up my self-will and allow God's will to be manifested in my life. With the key of willingness, my worries and fears are powerfully transformed into serenity. So Lectio Divina is a plan to open that door a little more to let God in so that God can take control over any problem or pain, even ones we haven't faced yet in the week. So to start with this process, we read scripture. And I usually do something small. We can read whatever we feel like, any scripture, really any scripture. And if I don't know what to read, I just generally pick a gospel reading from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Usually just the gospel reading of the week, like I did now. Because chances are, if you read a gospel reading, Jesus is going to be saying or doing something, and that works. So we're going to keep things short today. We started with John chapter 3, 14 through 21. But with this spiritual exercise, we're just going to use verses 14 through 17. It can be a long passage or a short passage, because the first step of Lectio Divina actually takes care of just that. We're going to read the passage for the first time, and as we listen, we'll narrow in on one specific phrase to focus on for the whole exercise. And we each pick for ourselves. Pick one word or pick a longer phrase, generally not more than a sentence. And a few of us will say our word or phrase out loud. Uh, if we're in a Lectio Divina group, it often helps to have a little discussion after every step, except usually step two. For the second step, we read the passage again and we reflect. We listen and this time we're silent. Remember to pay special attention to your word or phrase when we do this. And just reflect on what comes to you during the reading. For the third step, we read the passage a third time and we respond. We listen and then this morning a, a few of us will share what comes up. Is the passage telling us something? Is something jumping out? Is there just something that's jumping out as you've read this three times? Something getting your attention over and over again. And we can wait a bit for something to come up. I think we should. It's a short passage and that doesn't give us much time to reflect. So the idea is just to put it into words. And for the fourth step, I'm changing things because I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> Traditionally, the fourth step is rest, meaning the start of silence, contemplative prayer. And we're actually going to look at centering prayer another time. It's its own practice. But there's another way to do Lectio Divina that doesn't end in 20 or 30 minutes of prayer. For our fourth step, we're going to read the passage a fourth time. And this time, the focus is to reveal. We'll listen to this passage we now know so well. And we're going to open ourselves to hearing a takeaway for the week. This is a little similar to picking out a random star word for the year, if you remember us doing that. You had no control over what you picked up, and it's just something to reflect on. Well, how is this going to come up in my year? And obviously, we don't always know, and we're surprised. Uh, so this can be profoundly powerful. The idea is we're taking a random scripture, you literally can just flip through your Bible and pick a scripture. Uh, and maybe pick a scripture that's important in the moment. That works too. And follow this process to get something concrete 
about how we should approach the week. A great way to prevent a world where we all barge in is to simply take some time once a week to get some sort of takeaway from Scripture for our week and just carry it with us. There are weeks where I do this and I don't get a takeaway that's in words. And that's okay. I've still opened the door to willingness that much more. It's okay if, you know, in a group, I I used to do this as a group uh, downtown at 7 a.m. every Thursday. And not all of us had something to share every time. It's okay. The willingness is important. And just doing this exercise help us open that door so that God is in control. So let's prepare. I have four handouts. Can I have some volunteers to read just one of these? uh, It's very short. Okay. If I don't have volunteers, I have to pick people. (laughs) Anybody? Do you like Hermione? Do you like Hermione? Uh, kind of, but I just like the story. Uh huh. Right at the start, it says you, you, you can't operate inside the Hogwarts Court Club. How often do I, do I have to tell you? Said Hermione impatiently. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate that. You willing to be a reader? All right. And I need two more. My eyes lingered on you a little longer, so. I know, you were looking for <laughs> All right, one more. I'll, I'll let everyone know when it's, uh, when it's their turn. All right. Thank you, Joel. All right, so. Another step I think we should do is just make sure there's nothing distracting in the passage that maybe seems a bit confusing. And I would guess that maybe the the whole lifting up, Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness can be a little confusing. Um, So what actually happens there, it's an Old Testament story. And it's from when they're in the desert after they've left Egypt. And everyone gets bitten by snakes, just snakes everywhere. And God says, everyone will be cured if Moses takes this bronze snake and lifts it up and anyone who looks at the snake is cured of their snake bite. So what Jesus is saying is that Jesus is here and anyone that that looks at him like they looked at the snake will be cured. So doesn't really explain all that. It just says, just like Moses took this serpent and uh, held it up, So I just want that to not be distracting. Um, So real quick, to repeat the steps, we're going to read once, listen, then narrow down the passage. We're going to read a second time, listen and be silent. We're going to respond, listen, share what comes up. And then we're going to reveal and listen for a takeaway for the week. All right. Can we have our first reader? Yes. I'm going to put the readers on mic so you can hear me and set the alarm. Okay. Who's reader number one? What was that? Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's take a moment. You can close your eyes if you want to. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the servant, Uh, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Is there any word or phrase that jumped out to somebody? Hmm. 
Can I ask you to say that a little louder? I couldn't hear it. Believes. Believes. So we have condemned, we have believes. My phrase was through him. It's kind of making me think through him. Uh huh. Eternal life. Are there others? Son of man. All right. I thought Paul was saying condemned. Condemned? Okay. And just um, as a reminder to also pray when just this piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Time for a second reader. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. Jesus said, "As Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so may the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We're going to read the scripture a third time and then share what comes up. John 3, 14 through 17. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So we read it three times. Does anything kind of come up about your word or phrase? Maybe why it jumped out to you? Mm -hmm. I had a comment from Zoom from Rudo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, the phrase, not condemned. Hmm. Yeah, not to condemn. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, uh, as I was thinking on uh, through him, 
I was thinking that it doesn't say through me. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm maybe not supposed to look to do so many things myself. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. Um, Bob Hollis from New Zealand says, God is not an angry God. Christians do not condemn, but destroy. Mm. Yeah, I think sometimes this is more powerful than a sermon. It's a, it's kind of a reminder because I keep hearing so many positive words about God. Like many people look at God and look in the Bible and it says God is angry and, you know, God is upset. And we kind of maybe take some of our own emotions and put them onto God. We feel this way. We assume God does. But. That's not what I'm hearing from what people are sharing. I'm hearing about God being God of love. Yeah, but don't want to just you know just angry right away and just send you send you to the word epiphany. The word did you say epiphany? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have a sense of epiphany there of, um, you know, what we have here in the gospel and what was in the Old Testament and how that fit into the framework of the people of God. We've, we've had someone from Zoom share about um, condemned being not to condemn. Um, again, we've, we've had someone talk about grace and love and feeling like those words are just coming up even though they didn't appear specifically in the reading. Do we have any others? I guess on like juxtaposition to the Old Testament is the way like, you know, parents are not you know, like no offense to people who don't have kids, but Yeah. Yeah, we, we hear sharing there about parental love and what parents will do for their kids and how strong that is. And Joel was just saying that we don't see much of that in the Old Testament. Um, that's really something new that comes out here. Um, again, seeing, seeing God in a new way because the truth is being revealed. Do we have any others? All right. For our fourth time, we're going to follow my rules. When I did this with uh, at 7 a.m. downtown, we had this practice of reading it and saying, how are we going to take this out into the week? Uh, you know, I checked the internet. No one else really follows those rules. I haven't seen it anywhere. But, you know, it's a practice going back to the third century. We can, we can do something new with it. And I've found this to be really rewarding, just thinking about what just came up for you, what you just shared about your word and phrase, and how that applies to the week you have ahead of you and what you've got going on and how you can prepare and what you can be open to. So we're going to have the scripture one more time. John 3, 
uh, John chapter 3, 14 through 17. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not, did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Anyone getting a sense of how maybe this goes out into their week? Mm -hmm. I had a response from Rita on Zoom. So the response on Zoom from Rudo, except my apologies if I mis mispronounced your name. We had to read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God in school when I was growing up. How much do I need to unlearn? Whoever God is less judgmental than I am, God doesn't stop fighting for me when I fail. And then for an application, as you were to mention about carrying on into the week. I need to release my self-reliance when it comes to fixing my own mistakes through my own strength. God can be trusted. And I, I kind of get that same sense for mine with uh, through him, uh, that sense that I need to not be doing things through my own strength. Um, when I let go and trust, um, like this weekend, things went great. So that's, I think, the spot I need to be in, letting go and trusting. Are there others? For me, recently, I've been out of time and hungry. It's been a lot of years hungry here. And I think that is in the child of God. Mm -hmm. I need to find the child of God. But for God so loved the world, you know, I need to think the child. I need to think the love side of God because it's the same stuff. When you anger God, yeah, we can also be angry about it. God still loves us and still on his side. And I need to think of that. And I need to think of the beauty of that. Love. I hope I've been remembering to repeat these, but with Son of Man and God's Son, um, remembering this sense of of not being condemned and 
in return going out and not condemning the world, that that's hard, especially this past week, and that, um, you know, we have that impulse, and we've, we've seen that do harm. Um, I kind of veered into that before we started, but we can change that. We can change that by going out with something in our hearts before our week even starts. Mm -hmm. I just a note from Bob Hollis that for this week to be accepting and forgiving. To be accepting and forgiving. Are there others? All right. Nate, is it okay if we uh, do the Lord's Prayer a little early just to close this out? Can we all say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, 